popular culture. In 2006 and 7, Len was voted by his peers one of 50 most influential Christians in America by Church Report magazine. And in 2010, he was selected by the top non-English Christian website in one of the top 10 influential Christians of 2010. His popular podcast, Napkin Scribbles, is widely quoted, and he wrote for sermons.com for eight years. Now he currently hosts his own preaching website, preachthestory.com. For nine years, he and his wife wrote the entire content for the weekly preaching resource, Homiletics. In 2005, Len introduced the first open source preaching resource on the web, wikiletics.com. Len's microblogs on Twitter and Facebook rank as two of the most influential social media sites in the world. You can find some of Len's talks on his YouTube channel, www.youtube.com, Lenny Sweet Spots. Founder and president of Spirit Venture Ministries. In 1995, Len launched Sweet Soul Cafe, a spirituality newsletter purchased by Broadman's and Holman's Publishing. Len is a popular and highly sought after speaker throughout North America and around the world. In the past couple of years, he has spoken in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Brazil, England, Wales, South Africa, South Korea, Iceland, Scotland, and most recently China, Indonesia, and Latvia. Author of more than 200 articles, 1,300 plus published sermons, and more than 50 books, Leonard Sweet's publications include the bestsellers, Soul Tsunami, Aqua Church, Jesus Manifesto with Frank Viola, and Jesus, a theography with Frank Viola, as well as many other volumes that are revolutionizing the church's mission. Len released multiple books in 2012, including Viral, Why, Why Social Media, is poised to ignite revival. What matters most, the ebook, Real Church in a Social Network World. I am a follower, the greatest story never told. Revive us again. In 2011, Lenny published his first novel, The Seraph Seal, co authored with Lori Wagner. With an innovative website, www seraphseal.com. Currently, the E. Stanley Jones Professor of Evangelism at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and a visiting distinguished professor at George Fox University, Portland, Oregon. Lynn was Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the Theological School at Drew University from 1995 to 2001. He also serves as a consultant to many of America's denominational leaders and agencies. He is a member of the West Virginia Annual Conference. He is a frequent speaker at national and international conferences, state conventions, pastor schools, retreats. Len resides on Orcas Island, East Sound, in San Juan Islands, off the coast of Washington State. Wow. <laughs> I can't wait to hear you. Let's welcome Brother Dr. Leonard Sweet. So, Chris and I, with an introduction like that, you don't need the person. Let me just go home. But, uh, but how many of you here last night? How many of you here? Okay, quite a few of you were here last night. Wasn't that a special blessing? Yes. I, I was really touched. And I, I just wanted to mention that his text last night, anybody remember what it was? Deuteronomy 1, 
six to seven. That's where he started. Is my life verse? And let me tell you why. I'm a PK. How many PKs do we have here? Any other PKs? Okay, I'm the only. Come on, I can't be the only PK. All right. A PK means. Yeah, preachers get it. Pastors get it. Except the pastor of my household was my mother. My mother, I, see if you know this, was ordained by the Pilgrim Holiness Church. I've never heard of the Pilgrim Holiness Church. Okay, a few of you, you all should know this because Seymour, on his way to start this great new awakening, global awakening, called what? Azusa Street, was inspired by the founder of the Pilgrim Holiness Church, Dr. Knapp. And he wanted to go. Dr. Knapp pastored a church in Cincinnati, Ohio, and founded a school there, humbly named God's Bible School. And so, W.K. Seymour decided he was going to go and learn from Dr. Knapp. And so he went there. But by the time he got to Cincinnati, Dr. Knapp had died, so he stayed there. He entered into fellowship with this Pilgrim Holiness Church, and he then himself studied at God's Bible School. And he then went from, after he decided that Dr. Knapp and these Pilgrim Holiness people had everything right except one thing. And guess what that one thing was? They didn't do tongues. And he said, you got it wrong, because if you're really living a holiness life, you will be open to the full dimensions of the Spirit's gifts. But he said, basically, that this movement that he started in 1906 at where? Azusa Street. Street. was nothing but the Pilgrim Holiness Movement plus tongues. And so this is my mother. My mother was one of these Pilgrim Holiness uh, preachers. We, we buried her from the church that she founded and was its first pastor in Newport News, Virginia. Now, she's from West Virginia, from the mountains of West Virginia. A part of West Virginia, though, where Yankee was never just one word. It always came with another. And um, she was in her mid-30s. She had been, done all sorts of revivals, church plants. And she was doing a revival, this is 1946, after the war, in Newport News, Virginia. And uh, she, um, there was a guy who came to her revival meeting. And he had his heart strangely warmed. Except it was warmed by the preacher. <laughs> now he was also in his mid-30s, never been married, neither of them. But he was a free Methodist. You ever heard of that? Free Methodist, okay. And he was also from upstate New York, the Adirondack Mountains. And so he tried to date this woman, and he tried, and he tried, and he got nowhere, because the Bible says, according to my mother, and I wrote a whole book on her called Mother Tongue, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And for her, being from up north was enough unbelief <laughs> um, to disqualify him. Plus, those free methods were a little more liberal. You know. But at any rate, one day she said she was reading her Bible and how she finally decided to marry Dad, and it took a while. But how she finally decided to marry this guy is she was reading kind of, you know, the lucky dip method of Bible reading. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You just open up the Bible and you. Yeah. <laughs> and you hope it doesn't fall on Judas went hung. So what do you do with that one? So but she her finger fell on this verse. You have traversed this mountain long enough. Get towards the north. And so that was all the confirmation she needed. So she married my father in this this northerner, and uh, so we, we lived between these two mountains, the Allegheny Mountains and West Virginia and the Adirondack Mountains, all the mountain upstate New York. So it was wonderful last night for me. It was, I was reliving my life 
that verse. I would not be here today without that verse. And so I appreciate that. Uh, but I don't, I've never preached on that verse, and I was kind of convicted last night. Why have you never preached on your life verse? So I got to figure out something to do now. Huh? I, you, the, the band played "Lead Me to Calvary." Anybody here want to be led to Calvary tonight? Anybody want to go to Calvary? I, uh, I just feel that we need to be led to Calvary. And so I'm going to lead you there, but you know me, I'm not going to lead you there like. You've been led there before. Because we're going to, we're reading the Bible in a whole new way. Remember, it's the same word, it's the same. But we're just reading it not to pick out points and to slice and dice the verses, but to inhabit ourselves and live the story. So I want to take Calvary as one story. Um, and read it, not like we're used to reading it. Now, my tribe, I come from that Methodist tribe, okay? You all are Wesleyans, too. In fact, you're more Methodist today than we are. Um, Pentecostals are. But what we do in my tribe is we reduce the story of Calvary to what we call seven last words. Has anybody ever heard of this? You know what I'm talking about? So you have Good Friday services, you don't, you don't know okay. So we have these seven last words, and uh, every preacher gets one of the words, and you know we all fight for the best ones. <laughs> Nobody wants, um, you know, mother, the older. Um, some go, or today you'd be in the paradise, what do you do with that? You know? So there, there are all these last words, of course everybody, likes the big one, which is what? My God, my God. Why is thou forsaken me? So we all fight over that one. I like it. So, so we even have reduced the story of Calvary, our redemption story, our salvation story, to seven words. Now, we notice they're not even words. They're phrases. And, and and they're not last words because we got Jesus returning from the dead. So how, how do we how do we clap this as we're being led to Calvary uh, and realize that maybe in our focus on slice and dicing this up into nice little points and principles, we miss right three of the greatest stories in all the New Testament. How many did I say? All seven, quote, last words. And you know what the last words of the church are, right? They're not these. What are the last words of the church? We never did it that way before. <laughs> Those are the real last words. But these are, these are three of the most incredible stories in all the Bible. And we missed them. Because of our attempts to not read it as it was presented and as it was circulated in the early church. When, when you talk about the gospel, we, we today, we use stories to gussy up the gospel. No, stories are the gospel. The gospel means good. News. And how do you tell good news? You tell good news in stories. stories. So it's not gussy. It's the very heart of the gospel itself. Yes. So let's get to the heart of the gospel. Let's get to the heart of Calvary tonight. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Now here, here's the one that helped me. Here, here's my first, first one. Nobody wants, today you'll be with me in Paris. How do you do that? Now, in all the languages of the ancient world, we're talking about Latin, Eucharistic, Aramaic, Greek, Hebrew, the words for paradise and garden are the same. Exactly the same. So some translate it, today would be with me in paradise. Some translate it, today you'll be with me in garden. Because remember, Jesus is the last Adam. Okay. Whose mission it was to bring us back into the... Ah, you're good. Good theologians here. 
Okay. So let me tell you how I it helped, how I learned to understand the power of this. Um, I've never taken a course on Karl Barth, one of the greatest theologians, but some say the greatest theologian of the 20th century. I've read a little bit of this stuff, but I've never really taken a course on him. I didn't really understand his theology. Um, and so I decided, okay, I'm going to have to do something. So, but I didn't want to, he has nine volumes of these church dogmatics, and they're doorstop books. I mean, they're huge <laughs> monsters, 900 pages each. I mean, you know, what do you do with those? I wouldn't go to even get one. So I went on to Amazon, okay, and I said, I, I know how I'm going to start learning Bart. I'm going to read some of his sermons, okay. So I looked. Online, Amazon, is there a book of sermons that's not too long, it's really kind of thin, and I can read it really quick and say, I've read Mark. <laughs> so I went on Amazon, and sure enough, there's this little, little book, about this big, but it had like 113 pages, which is what I thought I could handle for to begin with. It was called Deliverance to the Captive, so I ordered it, and it came, and so I, I got it, and you know, I kind of picked up some things for my mom, so I just opened it up and did what? I started to read. Lucky did that. And so I picked, put my finger down, and Bart is in the middle of a rant. He is mad. He is fuming. Of course, I'm just coming at it cold. I'm just coming at it from here. And he's fuming at any portrayal of Jesus on the cross by himself. Never, he says, never, ever, ever should you ever show a cross with Jesus on it and not three crosses. He said, now if you got an empty cross, you're going to have an empty cross because there's only one of those crosses where there was a resurrection. But if you've got to put somebody on the cross, you got to have three crosses, not one. Because at Golgotha, the story is what? Three crosses, not one. Not I just got so I'm looking at this and reading this, I'm going, what in the world? Why? Why is he so upset? Why? What makes him so mad? There's got to be a bad story here. So I read why Barbara wrote this book. It was called, remember the title, Deliverance to the Captives. Here's the backstory. Bart lived all his life in Basel, Switzerland. He had a best friend who was a prison chaplain. His best friend would need to go on vacation sometimes, so he asked Bart, will you cover for me? And Bart said, yeah, I'll cover for you. So Bart went and preached sermons to convicts, to prisoners. When Bart died, of course, everybody assumed the kind of sermons he's preaching to convicts are what? Old sermons. He's just picking out old sermons to use. But when Bart died, they unlocked this drawer in his desk, and they found a whole stack of original manuscripts just written for those convicts. Now, immediately, I started to like Bart a little more. Because it's so Jesus, you bring the best to the least. God does the greatest work, not among the greatest people, but among the That's right. least people. And so here, Bart is living the gospel as he's writing original sermons for prisoners. He's not just sloughing off little stuff on So... I'm, I'm reading Bart now. I go back to reading Bart and, and I realize, okay, these sermons have an audience, and the audience is criminals, convicts. Hmm. And so Bart says, here's why it's so bad that you show one cross by itself and not three. Because Jesus didn't die by himself. He died as he lived in company with bad people. He spent his life with bad people. The best definition of the gospel I've ever heard. Jesus ate good food with bad people. And 
he died as he lived, accompanied by bad people. Now you imagine you're one of those convicts and you're hearing this. You're one of those prisoners. And immediately, you're captured in to his sermon. Because you're now one of those that are aware about a cross. And but Bart doesn't stop there. He said, in fact, now we know that in the eyes of the world, there wasn't just two bad people on either side of them. They looked there because, remember, they said, crucify him. And they chose Barabbas to free. And so they looked not just at three crosses and two bad people, but they looked at, they saw three criminals up there. Now we know one was good, two were bad, but the story of Calvary is what? One of the two became saved. That's the story of Calvary. Even on the cross, Jesus is still telling the story. Inviting people into the kingdom. And so, we have three criminals out there, but we know one's good, two bad. But the story is one became good. So Bart keeps this going. You know, three criminals up there, one good, two bad, but one became good. Now, just this is a side point, pastors here. Even Jesus on the cross only got 50%. <laughs> So when you're witnessing and testifying, and you're wondering how come I'm not doing any better than I'm doing, just remember, Jesus and the cross, how much better you think you are than Jesus? Even he only got 50%, and they're dying. They're dying. Oh, okay. So here, so I'm still with Bart. I'm still reading Bart now, okay? And so. I'm still not getting why so mad. He goes, okay, so we got three criminals, one good, two bad, one became good. And then, Bart says, in fact, the first convert in heaven is a convert. Think about this. The first convert in heaven is a convict. Oh, man. Think if you were one of those people hearing that sermon. You know, this is the first Christian community. First Christian community, you got Jesus and two bad people. One of whom became good. So you call yourself a church? Show me your bad people. You only associating with good people? You only spending your life and, and bringing the church good people? Preach. What are you better than Jesus? Because Jesus spent his life in, in company with bad people. Mm. Now, I'm going to stop right there. Because he takes it in some directions I don't like. But, let me just say, think about this. We've got this today we can be in paradise. The power of what it means that the first person in heaven, the first convert, is this criminal, this bad person, at the very last moment. Jesus shows mercy to, you know, the difference between mercy and love. Mercy is when you don't get something you deserve. Love is when you get something you don't deserve. <laughs> and he gets both love and mercy. But in the eyes of the culture, they're not just criminals. We know there's specific kind of criminals. What were those two people on the side of Jesus? They were thieves. Well, if they're looking out at three criminals up there, and we know the two of them were thieves, wait a minute, maybe the story of Calvary is really that. Not those two thieves on either side of Jesus, but that thief in the middle. that robbed from the woman at her well, at Jacob's well, her shame and her guilt. 
Maybe it, the story of Calvary is that third thief that robbed from the lepers their isolation and isolation. And, and maybe the story of Calvary is that third thief that robbed from the poor their last place at the table. Maybe the story of Calvary is that third thief that stole from Satan his power over you and me and that robbed from the grave its sting and victory. Maybe we've got to watch out for that third thief. That third thief that came to steal your heart from everything that wants to take it away from Jesus. Oh, yeah. So... Today would be in the paradise. As Jesus comes to steal us from all that keeps us away from all the things he has for us. Hmm. You say, okay, sweet. You got one story and one line. You got six more lines and two more stories. How are you going to do that? Another hard one that nobody wants. Woman, behold your son, behold your what's going on there? What's going on there? Hmm. Well, Jesus is dying for the world. For God so loved the world. the cosmos. He's dying. For the sins of the whole world, the brokenness, the, the hurting, the woundedness of the whole world. And the moment he's actually most universal, he's also the most particular and personal. Because how can he die for the sins of the world without healing this broken relationship he has between his two families. He's got two families. He's got an old family, his half-birth family from what's the village called? Nazareth. And then he's got his new family of all these disciples and all these followers. And so he's got a new family, which is a different kind of family, and then he's got his old family. Do you ever wonder why none of Jesus' family is part of the twelve? That ever bother you? Jesus is 30 years in Nazareth. Now 30, remember our first day? 30 is our equivalent of 60. Okay. So Jesus spent his whole life, and it's now time for him to save the world. His mission is going to begin. And so what does Jesus do? He, I, if it were me, I'm going, I've got to have buddies, i got to have friends, i got to have people that I'm really close to. So I'm going to say to them, what? Come on, it's time to go. We need, I need you. I need you because we got to, my mission kicks in and I need you with me. Jesus chooses nobody from his first ten years. His brothers want nothing to do with it. When they do come for they try and take them away. In fact, the only place he can do no miracle is where? His hometown. And when he does go back to his hometown, what do they want to do to him? Now let's be serious here. Do you know what an honor's killing is? You're so embarrassed and humiliated the family, it's the job of the family to kill you. And that's what they want to do. They, they, they want him to throw him off a cliff. That's called stoning. That's the Jewish form of capital punishment. His hometown wanted to do an honor's killing on him because he had so brought disgrace because he claims he is the his brother James doesn't get a part of his ministry way later after the resurrection. Jesus has nobody from his hometown, nobody from his first 30 years as part of his team. And so he's got these broken family relationships, his home family that doesn't know what to do with them, is embarrassed by him. And he's got his new family, but how can he heal? The wounds of the world when he's got this open wound to these two families. And so one of the most poignant moments as he's dying on the cross, as he's dying for you and for me, 
for the world. I was at Max, and from that moment on, it tells us this for a reason. Mary moved in with John and lived with him until she died. Why do we need to know that? Because when the eldest dies, who gets the mother? The next one in line. So who should have gone to? James. But Mary doesn't go to James to symbolize that they're one family now. She stays with John. And lives with him until she dies. Jesus' most cosmic, most universal, and most personal. In particular, at the same time. You say, okay, sweet, now you're really in trouble. Because here we are at the end. You got five more words in one story. I'm going to pull this one off. Just read this story. The story. Um, if I ask you to close your eyes right now, in fact, don't close your eyes. Very, very close your eyes. Come up with an image of Jesus preaching. Can you do it? After dogs been here, I know you can come up with an image of Jesus praying. Okay? What about image of Jesus healing? Tomorrow morning we're going to talk about image of Jesus eating. Okay? What about him teaching? What about him walking with his disciples? What about him singing? Wait a minute. Close the open up your eyes. Anybody have an image anywhere of Jesus singing? Do you know nobody in history has ever painted anything? Jesus said, We have 60 photographs and laughing in a mic. So Jesus didn't say, Are you kidding me? He's a Jew. And what do Jews do all the time? They sing. And what do they always sing is the Psalms. The Psalms are their hymn book. And a Jew would never just say the Psalms. You've got to. Sing it. So if you're just talking about the, the psalm, if I'm going to quote Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I can't say it. I've got to sing it. How in the world did we miss this? We have no. And you know how important this is because remember, you were with me yesterday or was it the day before? I don't know. This culture, you communicate to this culture how? Story and song. And he cries and was right. This is my this is my yeah. And so we have no Jesus song, we have no Jesus soundtrack, because we have nothing that says to us that Jesus, are you, how did we miss this? You say, what in the world are you talking about? You got five words? How it, okay. The word that we all wanted, my God, my God, why is that forsaken me? Are those Jesus' words? No. What are they? The first line of Psalm 22. He would never have said those words. He would have sung those words. And oh, by the way, the rest of the words, of the five last words, are guess where they are? In the psalm. And the psalm ends, Psalm 22 ends, with the words that the high priest uses when he ends the Passover and slays the Paschal Lamb. And when the Paschal Lamb is slain, he ends Passover with the words, It is finished. The greatest song ever sung in the history of the world. How did Jesus usher himself into eternity? He ushered himself with a, there was sung from the cross. So I want us to stand tonight. And I'll stand. And we're going to put Psalm 22 up on the screen. And I want us to read together. I'm going to break it. I'm going to 
burst into it at times, so be prepared for me to stop it. But we're going to read together the song, Jeremy, the song that our Messiah sang that ushered him into eternity with his mother and John and the three, the three Marys at the feet with all the other disciples, what? Hiding. So the women were more faithful to him than those apostles. We're not going to go there. But, and here we have to the choir minister, the son of David. Let's say it together. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? My God, wait a minute, yeah. Oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer. By night, and am not silent. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust. They trusted, and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. And you they trusted, and we're not disappointed. Let me stop here. So, wait a minute. So this is not a, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me song? You notice this is a song now of praise and a proclamation. Wait a minute. So, so Jesus didn't have any, my God, my God, why is thou forsaken me moments? Well, wait a minute. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? When he spent all night, what? In anguish of spirit. Please take this cup from me. Remember, he's telling his disciples, stay away. And he goes and catches them, and they're always what? Well. Yeah, that's why we call them the duh disciples. Because they never do get it. So, here we have um, Jesus, so God forsaken in his spirit, and it's been this wrestling with God that he does what? What's the sign? Sweats blood. You know what blood is? Look it up. It's called hematridosis. N e h e m a t r i d o s i s. It's when the body scalps its skin. Most people don't survive hematridosis because once you've got no skin, not the whole body, but a lot of the body, just this total, just raw flesh. Why do you think he couldn't carry that cross? It's just, when, when you've had hematidosis, first of all, most people die from it, but if you live from it, you can't even get a feather near that person who's just so weird, just the... Yeah. And Jesus is nailed to the cross, the raw skin. And that's, a, that's God for... He doesn't need two God for second moments. He, this is Gethsemane. This is Calvary. It's a whole different song. Let's keep going. But I am a worm and not a man. Sworn by man and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even I don't know this prayer. Now, you can imagine as he's singing this, right? As he's singing this, what's he doing? He's looking at Mary. Mm. With all the love and gratitude that he has. He's just loving her with her eyes, with his eyes. And as he sings this song, now you say, it doesn't say he sang the song. This is, this is how Hebrews tell stories. Right? Most scholars will admit that if it has the first line and the last line, he what? So. He sang the whole thing. But even if you say, well, you know, um, if you can find those other things in here, it doesn't say he sang the whole song. Well, let me tell you, if I do this, my hope is built on nothing less than. And I stop there. What are you doing? Singing the. 
the rest of the song. See, he's summoning up all of Psalm 22. I am 99 and 99% sure he's saying, also probably many times. This is on that cross for how long? Six hours. See, you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust you, even at my mother's breast. Let's keep going together. Come on. From birth, I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb, you are then my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me, strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open against their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax. It has melted away within me. Let's stop right here. This is huge. You all know what Jesus died of, right? What did he die of? He did not die of crucifixion. See, he himself said, you did not kill me, I gave up the ghost. So what does that mean? When you, crucifixion is the science and art of torture. By the Romans, it's never been equal, much less excelled. I mean, it is the mastery of torture. Torture kills you. Slowly, over many days, the person crucified was killed, was hung up on that cross for days. And then they were totally naked and with all body parts and functions exposed because part of the crucifixion was to kill you slowly, psychologically, emotionally, and then organ by organ as your organs would shut down and people would laugh at you, vomit. They'd laugh at, at, as you as you cry and, you, and, and you'd sweat. And I, can I stop there? And you couldn't get anywhere near anybody who's like, because the squirt of spray from body fluids would drive you away. Those three women and John that stayed close to him, this is amazing. If they were even that close to have a conversation. So you were killed many, and you were up many, many days. And Jesus was nailed to the cross at nine. And he died at Oh, by the way, there's things going on in the temple between nine and three, but that's going to take a long time, so I don't have to do that. So, so what did Jesus die of? Oh, well, we know he died well, because when they split his side open, when they split his side, what came out? Which means what? He died of a literally. He, he, we'd say that he popped an error. We say his heart burst. The poetic way of talking about it is he died of a broken heart. He, he, he did not kill me. I gave up my life. I died. How better can you describe? Uh, um, go back on. Um, that my heart has turned to wax. See, Jesus, do you get this? The song. Jesus is singing his own story on the cross. It's not Carmen that did this verse. It's Jesus who's singing what's happening to him as it is happening. He always gets to the future before us. Even here, he's in the future before us. As we are doing them, he's singing the song as a fulfillment of prophecy to let them know they are not in charge. Keep going. My strength is dried up. Let's together. My strength is dried up like a posture. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. In other words, what? I... It's another way of translating my first. Yeah. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have in my feet. I can count all my people stare and glow over me. They divide my garments among them. I cast lots of my clothing. But you, O Lord, be not far off, O oh, my strength. Come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword. 
and our precious life from the power of the dog. We've had dogs referred to twice. Jesus twice prays, deliver me from the dogs. Deliver me from the dogs. What's that about? Well, part of the humiliation was after you were after they crucified you, it took many days. And you ultimately did it. And crucifixion, you died of asphyxiation. Um, but after, then what did they do? They left you up. Because that was part of, they loved to desecrate the body and, and dehumanize the body and make fun of the body. But so they would all watch over many, many days afterwards as the vultures would come and rip the flesh right off the dead body on the cross. And then what would happen to once the flesh was off? The, the bones would fall to the ground where the... And that's why over tens of thousands of crucifixions we've only found one remains of anybody crucified because there were no remains. Because they all went to the... And so who answered Jesus' prayer? Save me from the dogs. What are their names? Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, who saved him. Thank God for Joseph of Arimathea mm. and Nicodemus, who saved him from the dogs. Keep going. Ready? Rescue me from the wild oxen. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I, I will, will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, I praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised or disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. This is a song of victory, brothers and sisters. Let's say it like it's a, this is a victory cry, a victory song sung from the cross. From you come the theme of my praise. Before those who fulfill you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. Many other hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And the rich of the earth will feast and worship, all who go down to the dust will kneel before him. Those who cannot keep themselves alive. You were here last night. For the visit to hell as Jesus went down to the dust. First thing Jesus does in his resurrected form is not go up, but go all the way down. The very bowels of hell and release the captives there. Keep going. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn. For he has done it. What's another translation of this? It is the greatest song ever sung in the history of the world. And we missed it. Yeah, we did. It's not a despairing song. It's not a despairing cry. It's a... Do, do you know the word gospel? Euangelion, the word we get from it. Euangelion, before the Christians used it, had a specific meaning. And it was a political, military usage. And in the day of Jesus, you know, they had nations, we say nations, but there were no nations. They had, they had villages, they had city-states, I mean, they had all sorts of unique ways. But when one village went to war against another village, the winner, who was called to the victor, belongs the... Okay, if you were the loser, you were the... Spoils. If you were the victor, you got... You got everything. So it was all or nothing. You either won or you lost, and if you won, you got everything, and you lost. 
Men, what's your future? Dad. Women, what's your future? I don't need to say it. Old people, what's your future? Dead. Dead. So what they would do is they would post watchmen right at the outside, outskirts of the village. And every campaign would have somebody designated to be the runner. That's what they were called. And the watchman would watch as high as up as he could get for the runner. Because the runner had to bring you news of whether you had won or lost. Because if you lost, your only hope was what? Yeah. Run. Now they're going to come after you, but at least you had to run. And so you're, but also you don't know. You're living in total anxiety. Are we going to, what's going to happen to us? And so the runner, sometimes the runner would run for days, depending on whether it was clear what the outcome was. And by the way, those runners would come and they would not stop. And sometimes there were stories of them just as they got to the watchman, they would die from exhaustion. <laughs> There's another, um, blessed are the feet of those who... See, the word for if we won, if the victory's been won, the word is euangelion, euangelion, which means good news, gospel. And the only time the first people to pick it up were the... Christians that use that military political word for what it is that we're all about. We have a story of and on the cross, Jesus. See, we have a runner. Jesus is the runner. Who ran from heaven to earth and with bloody hands and bloody feet he declared on the cross you have a... You're saved! You're saved. The victory's been won. You're saved. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for taking us to Calvary. May we experience Calvary like we've not done it before. May we open ourselves up to some fresh air here. We understand the whole story of how you are always ahead of us, and even on the cross, we're singing your story. The song and the story of one. You have declared victory. That third thief stole from Satan, stole from hell, stole from death and the grave. It's victory. For that ultimate great robber, Jesus. We praise you tonight and give you the glory. And all God's people said. Amen. It's very late, and I don't want to keep you, but I do want you to know that if you anybody here would like to come and pray with us, we're open to it. I, I sense tonight that God is calling some of you to some places you don't want to go. You know, Jesus calls us the, when you follow him, we've got to take up the cross. Uh, some, we don't have, some people want us to take up their cross. We all have to take up a cross. We don't have to take up all the crosses. You know what I mean? And some people have a cross and they, they want me to take their cross. And I go, no, I got my own cross. So part of your, our responsibility is to say no to people who want us to take their cross with them because we've all got a cross to bear. And we all have to die on a cross. We don't have to die on all crosses. And God tells us what cross to die on. But we all have a cross to bear. It's hard to take up some of these crosses. It's hard for us to, to say yes. But there's anybody here that I just sense tonight wants to be called or summoned as these anointed ones have been to take up this leadership cross, this servant role. It's God calling you to go somewhere. How do you know you're living in the stream of God's Spirit? Sometimes.
time or some place that you went that you do not wish to go, then who's in control of your life? We're all being called. Sometimes to go in directions we don't want to go. So I invite you if you want to come. You know, the world's a better place because Michelangelo didn't say, I don't do ceilings. The world's a better place because Adam didn't say, I don't do Eve. The world's a better place because Abraham didn't say, I don't do unknown destinations. The world's a better place because Ruth didn't say, I don't do mothers in law. The world's a better place because David didn't say, I don't do giants.
give you an ancient benediction. But I'm going to translate the last line my own way. All right? Will you let me do that? If this is my turn, you, you read the message, right? Eugene Peterson um, translated it this way, so I'm going to give you my way. So I'm going to give it the way we all know it. You can say it with me, but then the last line, I'm going to say it twice, and the last line, I'm going to change it a little bit. All right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you. Now, we all have kids, some of us do, but we don't say to them, lift up your countenance. At least I don't think we do. So it's not a phrase that is very familiar. So I'm going to give you my translation of that last line, but you're going to say with me the first two. Ready? The Lord. Let us do and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. Now, here's the real Hebrew. And may God's face radiate with joy because of you. And may God's face what? Radiate with joy. Because of you. Go on to this world and may God's face radiate with joy. Because you are radiating his joy. Joy of the one who sang. Praise to yeah. his Father and saying, Your victory is only mine on the cross. And all God's people said. Could we just celebrate the Lord some more? Give God praise for the mystery of the Word tonight. I just want to just mention a few things to you as we uh, have done every night. We, we will do the official benediction at, on Friday night, and um, but you have been blessed by the message and you've been blessed in prayer. Just want to remind you, uh, tomorrow we begin at 9 o'clock, uh, 9 a.m. with our devotional, and then, um, well, sorry, we have prayer meeting uh, at 7 a.m., then there is a breakfast at, 10, at, at 8 a.m., then we have the devotional at 9 a.m., then we go into several uh, special uh, sessions, you don't want to miss it, you're going to hear again from Dr. Nancy Sweet, uh, Javon Butler, uh, Mr. Burge, uh, then we're going to uh, also um, hear from Dr. Patrick Sands, and, and then Dr. Daniel Days, you don't really want to miss that, and Daniel Butler. Then we have the luncheons tomorrow. The men luncheon will be in the uh, Calvary Temple Youth Chapel, and then the ladies luncheon is going to be at the Flamingo Restaurant in the Castaway uh, Resort. If I had my choice, I think I would go to the women's luncheon, <laughs> but I, I am com I'm, I'm compelled to be with the men. So, um, so, so we want to remind you of all of that. Uh, now also, uh, pastors and ministers, uh, please uh, proceed to the uh, youth chapel where you will receive refreshments. And we just uh, want you to be out tomorrow. Don't miss it. Every session has been uh, absolutely powerful. And it is going to get better each day. So um, you are uh, released. Oh, the tickets, sorry. We got to mention about the tickets. The uh, men's luncheon is $10, and the women's luncheon is $20. Oh, okay. We ask that the assistant commissioner, along with his team, uh, would please also join us for refreshments. And um, so, uh, we are going to hear from this wonderful choir as we are released um, to go and depart for tonight and be back here tomorrow. God bless you. Have an incredible evening.